Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> 50 million people, five decades of isolation. Until 2010, Burma was ruled by one of the world's most oppressive dictatorships. That year, the military regime held elections. They were semi-legit at best, but enough to excite Western corporations. Sanctions fell, and money poured into one of the world's last untapped markets. The cities are transformed, cell phones and buildings and unending traffic where five years ago there were almost no cars. But change comes slowly in the countryside, and most of Burma is countryside. We wanted to see these places, long closed to the outside, and hear the music that outlasted history's onslaught. So we bought half-dead Chinese motorcycles and rode through the mountains of eastern Burma, searching for raw music. Music is everywhere in Burma. More than 100 ethnic groups, each with a style and sound. Phones are starting to show up in these remote parts, and bad house music knows no bounds. But traditional music is still dominant for now. In the town's pagoda, oil paintings of farmers fighting the Burmese military. Since 1948, the Karen people have been fighting for a degree of autonomy from the government. People say life is better since the elections. You don't really see the state anymore, but you still feel it. Those old fears of saying the wrong word to the wrong person. The memories of thousands of villages burned to the ground by the military. They don't just disappear. It's still illegal for foreigners to stay with civilians, so we stayed at the monastery. No one is quite sure of the rules in the new Burma, but men of God seem to have a bit more leeway in this deeply religious country. Like bored people everywhere, we smoked cigarettes and watched laptop videos with the monks. Our route north was blocked. The dry season still means fighting between the numerous rebel groups and the government. So we rode through the plains of Bago province. This is negative. At a repair shop in a tiny village, it felt like we entered another country. The language was Hindi, the gods Hindu, but no one had ever stepped foot in India. The British colonized Burma and brought in thousands of Indian workers throughout the 1800s. The Indians never returned, working as farmers and merchants, keeping their culture alive, but calling Burma home.
Before we left, our host insisted we see Pioneer. Pioneer turned out to be a new rest stop on the road to Mandalay, with bright lights and buildings from the Des Moines School of Architecture. No one could give us directions to the next village. They had rarely left their own. Under the dictatorship, movement was severely restricted, and there was no money for travel anyway. Like so much of the Burma we saw, these places felt isolated and self-sustaining, each with their own language and music, worlds away from Yangon and the capital. We said goodbye to our friends and rode off to places they might never see. In the 1800s, fervent Italian missionaries built Catholic churches in the mountains between Tonggu and Loikau. Their churches still stand and their congregations believe. Like most missionaries, the Italians fought hard to cut down the heathen local music, and these ghostly hymns were the only songs we heard in the mountains. <laughs> Sunday, the devout Catholics of Burma's hills come to pray. Christians make up about 4% of Burma's population, but a disproportionate number of its 1 million refugees. Now that Burma's opening up, Neighboring countries are closing refugee camps, and thousands of ethnic and religious minorities are returning to a place they uneasily call home. We used to need permits to travel anywhere in the country. Now we rode past sleeping guards at roadblocks. The conscious ones wanted nothing to do with us. Too much hassle. And though Kaya State was closed to foreigners until a couple years ago, the Kaya and Lawi have experienced with tourists. As refugees in Thailand, many of the women were exhibited in what amounted to human zoos. We were wary of this long history of exploitation, but Da Mutu's capitalist instincts were on point. The Cayenne ladies were the only people to charge us for music on this trip. The tables turned, and it was worth it. On our trip, we heard at least 10 languages and stayed with Christians, Buddhists, Hindus. All of this is Burma, though each place felt like its own world. The traditional Saiwan orchestra plays psychedelic free jazz, led by 21 tuned drums. The band was preparing for a nap play. Despite the diversity, Burma is overwhelmingly Buddhist, and like most things here, they do religion a little differently. The nats are spirits carried over from pre-Buddhist times. They interfere in daily life, possess people, and are celebrated regularly. A nap play is part block party, part religious revival, part performance art. The band plays all day. The spirit medium operates outside society's norms. 
Ja, 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 Our translator Ricky, a teenage Muslim with a selfie addiction, wasn't feeling it, so we watched on our own. People were kind but kept their distance, the dance between manners and self-preservation. Pretty soon though, we were all in. Burma's in uncharted territory. New money, new influences, a sort of new government nobody really trusts. The villages are isolated as ever and at the mercy of larger forces. Uncertainty is a constant, but so are warmth, humor, kindness, and music. And that's how you get by. NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and then click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.